Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome um, to everyone who's joined for this evening's Chancellor's Lecture. I'm Reni Fritchie. As Chancellor of the University of Gloucestershire, it's my pleasure to open this event. One of the unexpected outcomes of our first lockdown earlier this year was the striking effect it had on the environment. The air was immediately cleaner, the skies bluer, and our roads quieter and almost pollution free. And with exercise possible, people started walking and cycling and were able to observe and appreciate these changes. I think it also gave hope to people to think that maybe we could do something significant to address these things in a faster time scale and that every one of us could help to affect policies and outcomes, as well as make an individual difference. It gave us a practical and much needed example close to home. Also close to home is the work that's been developing in Wales, from intention to policies, from policies to design, and then to measurable outcomes. This university has been working to deliver a more sustainable future for many years now. We're still number one in the People and Planet League and the only university to have placed in the top 10 in every run of this league. Of course, we still have more to do and we're currently working on our third institution-wide strategy, 2021, which will align to the new corporate plan and 10-year university vision. Because of this long-standing interest and our commitment, we invited Dr. Jane Davidson to share her Welsh journey with us so that we might all benefit from her wisdom and experience. Jane is an extraordinary person. As Minister for the Environment, Sustainability and Housing, she proposed the Wellbeing of Future Generations uh, Wales Act, the first piece of legislation anywhere in the world to place regenerative and sustainable practice at the heart of government. In her talk tonight, she'll share this journey and her insights as she led this work. She's currently Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales in Trinity, Trinity St. David's and a patron of the Chartered Institute for Ecology and Environmental Management. Jane lives in Welsh Wales on a small holding where she says she aims to live lightly on the land. She is a new, unique leader in this work, and we're very privileged to have her here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jane Davidson. Rennie, what a lovely, lovely introduction. And I can't thank you enough for inviting me to join uh, with you here at the University of Gloucestershire this evening at your lecture, the Chancellor's Lecture. And what's really interesting in terms of your introduction is that I left politics in 2011 and I started working in the university sector. And the very first invitation that I received to go to another university to talk about my work was from Professor Daniela Tilbury at the University of Gloucestershire. And so I remember coming in the September of 2011 and talking about what I hoped would happen in Wales. And now here we are talking about what has happened in Wales and all the better for the fact that I may have left the proposal, but I was not part of the new administration that delivered it. And so I'd like to tell people on the call this evening a little bit of that journey, because it may be a journey of a country, but it's a journey of a small country. And that very notion of being a journey of a small country actually enables us to think about whether it can also be applied into a university setting, as it was indeed in my own university, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, where the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is right at the core of the corporate plan. But I feel very uh, privileged to particularly be here because you've been such a pioneer in the University of Gloucestershire, such a pioneer in the context of sustainability, one of the earliest pioneers among universities. 
and you didn't um, kind of flash and burn as many others have done, but you have continued uh, to embed education for sustainable development in your curriculum. You have continued to put sustainability at the heart of what you do. And I loved looking at your digital uh, prospectus and your campaign, Who Cares We Do? And as part of that, the celebration of people and planet where rightly you are top of all the universities in the UK. Now the journey in Wales is like many, many journeys. It starts with a first step and then it often goes very badly wrong <laughs> before it goes right. And that first step was also not taken by me, but put people before me. In the 1998 Government of Wales Act, Wales was given a constitutional duty to promote sustainable development in everything that it did. And as a new assembly member coming in in 1999 uh, to our first devolved uh, legis uh, legislature in Wales. It was incredibly exciting coming in with that duty, uh, particularly to someone like me who'd been both an educator and an environmentalist all my life. But it was really difficult to deliver on that duty. I mean all those of us who've been involved as decision makers know that we have to know what we are deciding, what we're trying to take forward, but we also have to know how to get there. And a duty to promote sustainable development sounds great until sustainable development is not defined. And therefore, exactly what are we promoting? I mean, I know from my own university that the word sustainable was much more often applied to um, the finances of the university than it was to any notion in the context of the environment, for example. But if we think about trying to pull together a how and a what, what you want to achieve and how you're going to get there, then in fact, it turned out over a period of a number of years that actually, because we didn't know what was meant by sustainable development, even though we defined it as development that meets uh, the needs of the current generations without compromising on the needs of future generations, the, what's called the Brundtland definition. Although we were clear about that, what there wasn't was an understanding in the civil service, in public services and among the politicians in Wales about what achieving sustainable development looked like in any way whatsoever. And we had as part of this duty uh, a duty to produce a scheme. So that was very helpful that the scheme could actually lay out the direction of travel we were going in. And in our first scheme, we actually laid out something that in many ways looks remarkably similar to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But in that first few years of the National Assembly, we were hit by flooding. We were hit by foot and mouth. We were hit by major job reductions in the steelworks and we had very few powers. So this big notion about how you delivered on sustainable development became something that moved into the nice to have category rather than something that was able to define the new institution. And in the second administration, we thought, right, well, we're going to make this much more real, much more tangible. So rather than having a big vision about it, we'll create a series of actions, at least one in every ministerial portfolio, so we can show it's happening across the piece. And we did. But I can honestly say that although they were all achieved, of course, they were derided externally by those who felt that it was like 10 actions for a better planet, but at the side of the core work. And that's what I inherited when I came into the role of having the responsibility to take forward the third scheme in 2007. And I knew that the intentions of the previous ones had both been great, but it's a bit like corporate plans or any sustainability strategies. You can have the right intentions, but there's something about the timing you're in the opportunity that can be taken, the money that is available, and the appetite for the change. And you almost have to have all those in place 
if you're going to make a significant difference. So the scheme I proposed uh, was called One Wales, One Planet. And I was very lucky because I did this in a coalition government between Labour and Plaid Cymru, which meant between us, we were two thirds of the National Assembly. So I had no worries about getting my scheme through the National Assembly, provided it got through the two political parties. Um, and I wanted it to have both the best of the first scheme for it to be all embracing, but I wanted it to be all embracing in a very specific way. And what I proposed at the time was that sustainable development should become the, the central organising principle of our government. And that's what we took through the political systems. And I was absolutely overjoyed when I was able to take that through cabinet with absolutely universal support and then take it through the National Assembly for Wales as well. And there was a sort of element whereby having got this through, I was a, I sort of sat back and thought, great, it's now the central organising principle of government. But Chancellor, you will know better than most that what you say and what happens <laughs> are not ne necessarily connected unless there is a clear mechanism. And what became very clear was the lack of clarity that people perceived in still how to define what was this central organising principle of government? What did it mean? And although we'd laid it out in a vision document that in fact I include as a um, an annex to my book because it was consulted on so widely across Wales and largely written by civil society. Many civil servants couldn't see what their role was in delivering on a vision of civil society which had not been explicitly asked for by the politicians. So in a sense I was learning the hard way that you may think that you've achieved a moment and have got to your top of your mountain but that actually the lack of clarity meant that people did not know what to do with this commitment. So as has happened on many occasions around climate change, of course, everybody said, we support it. We think this is absolutely brilliant. There is no other way of doing business than doing it this way. Of course, we've got to do it this way and carried on behaving as usual, <laughs> which of course was completely in the wrong direction. And I think the importance of that as the story on the way is the fact that it was only as a result of that journey and then my asking the Wales Audit Office for a view on whether or not we were delivering and they told us that we were delivering in the sense that at no point ever had the National Assembly for Wales failed to deliver on its duty to promote. So we had never failed the duty in law. But they also said that having looked at the business end of the uh, government, i.e. the civil service, that it was not in any way filtered down as a priority from the top of the office to those people uh, in, who made up the bulk of the civil servants. So we had on one hand that we'd never failed to deliver, although not made changes, and the fact that this was not actually institutionally embedded in the organisation. You could not have gone to a porter or somebody coming in, uh, or a cleaner, or somebody coming in at a low level inside the organisation and asked them whether or not this was important in the organisation they would not have known this was the case. And I think that's an acid test. It's something I definitely tested in Trinity to check that everybody knew that it was a priority for the organisation. But what that also meant was that there was, a, there was a view from civil society that even with this central organising principle, that no, even the politicians who'd signed up to it were not doing enough, and that included me. And they commissioned an external report. And although I probably came out better than most, I did not come out uh, completely squeaky clean on this either. And these were wake up calls. But the very biggest wake up call was the fact that there was a body, which I'm sure everybody um, on, on this call may know about, which was called the Sustainable Development Commission. It had been in place 
uh, from the year 2000 to 2010, it was an absolute wonder of expertise from across the world. It had no politics. It served six administrations over its 10 years of all political persuasions because it worked with all the four countries in the UK. And its expertise was profound and it called on best expertise from elsewhere in the world, whether that was the OECD or, or others. And overnight in 2010, when the Conservative Liberal Democrat government came in, the Sustainable Development Commission was disbanded. Now, in many ways, that was the most important um, moment for me, because how could we have a situation where we had a body that was well respected by all the governments, well respected by all the civil servants in four administrations of completely different political persuasions that was just removed overnight? And particularly the idea of a body promoting sustainability being removed overnight. And it was on the journey back from Bristol, where that 10th anniversary conference was, to Wales, a, a mere matter of three quarters of an hour, that I actually determined what needed to be the underlying principles of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And those underlying principles were these. It must apply to all public services. It must apply to the government. Now this is where it's unusual. It must apply to the government as well as those public services, i.e. the government was also accountable to the act. Most governments make acts for others, they don't make acts for themselves. So, it, so in applying it to government, it puts it in a different kind of category. It must be audited by the audit office because the audit office audited all the public services. So it meant the audit office would have to change how it audited. And then that meant that everybody would benefit from that learning journey. And it must have an independent commissioner. And that independent commissioner must have substantial rights, both to name and shame organisations and be both a critical friend, but potentially to take organisations to court. Because the difference with this is it's a law and not policy. And that was the bombshell that I left the incoming uh, administration with. So when I went off to work in the university sector in 2011, I left the incoming administration with a proposition to create an act to deliver on this, not just to promote it. So I'm now just going to share a small number of slides with you that just demonstrate the content of the act. So here we have, and I just want to check you can see it. Yes, excellent. Here we have an act. I know it doesn't look like an act, but this is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. It has seven interlinked goals that's uh, underpinned by four pillars. And what's really important about those pillars is anybody who's been involved in the sustainability agenda, as you all have for so long in Gloucestershire, will know that uh, environmental, social and economic aspects are the normal three-legged stool on which sustainability sits. But I'm delighted to say that by adding culture, not only in the Welsh context am I, have we created an Eisteddfod chair of a piece of legislation, but actually culture is actually the key. Because culture is about identity, it's about heritage, it's about the arts, but it's also about behaviour change. And unless behaviour change is delivered, then in fact the other elements are never delivered effectively because it's the culture of organisations that define how to deliver the outcomes. Here we have the goals. The goals you saw a moment ago in that jigsaw are actually goals in the legislation and the importance of them being in the legislation is the fact that each one of these definitions is now a legal definition. So hopefully, although you may be able to read them, indulge me with the first one in particular, because we now have a situation in Wales where the prosperity, the economy of the country, is defined as innovative, productive and low carbon, 
recognizing the limits of the global environment, using resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change, and which develops a skilled and well-educated population in an economy which generates wealth and provides employment opportunities, allowing people to take advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work. Now, just thinking about applying that as we did previously in our own university setting in Wales, it means that what you are enabling students to understand is the way in which they can engage in that innovative, productive and low carbon society. It's new skills as well as traditional skills. It's also about learning what the limits of the global environment are and using resources efficiently and proportionately, something which you do through your engagement with people and planet and your understanding of education for sustainable development. And when we're talking about people taking advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work, it is something that has now meant that every single university in Wales is now uh, delivering on the living wage. Now, universities should have always been delivering on the, on, on the living wage, but it has not always been the case. And I think that in the context, if you then look at these other goals, it's not just about maintaining biodiverse natural environments, it's about enhancing. And we know with the loss of biodiversity that has been seen so far in the UK and more widely, this an issue around how we enhance biodiversity, which also means on our own doorstep. What do we do as organisations? What do we do as individuals? What do we do as towns, as cities, as countries? And in the context of health, a big issue over the period of this uh, dreadful COVID pandemic has of course been about people's mental well-being as well as their physical well-being. And therefore, in law in Wales, choices and behaviours that benefit future physical and mental health are understood. So there's a much greater onus on the health boards in Wales, um, on our, all other sectors in Wales, the governments, universities, schools, local authorities and others, in terms of trying to create conditions that will maximise mental health. Equality, fulfilling people's potential, um, no matter what their background or circumstances, of course the protected characteristics, but also very importantly, since Wales is the poorest part of the United Kingdom, their socioeconomic background and circumstances. Attractive, viable, safe and well-connected communities, a society that promotes culture, heritage and language. And I think the last one is also very important, which is in the context of um, making sure that Wales does not offset any carbon emissions. So it doesn't say we're going to uh, do things things in Wales and of course since Wales was the heart of the Industrial Revolution and the first country in the world where a million pound cheque was signed in the coal exchange you know it's a particularly important narrative for us that a globally responsible Wales is a nation when, when it's doing all those things also looks at making a contribution to global well-being. Also in the Act and that what's very important about those goals is the fact they are in the Act, therefore they are a legal mechanism, not just a policy mechanism, are these five ways of working. So having to think long term, preventatively, having to integrate those goals, so thinking about how you can integrate goals um, together so that you're thinking about health and the environment and the economy at the same time, collaborating with others and actually requiring collaboration. So cross sectors, cross fertilization of ideas and relationships, and very importantly, involving uh, people who are affected by decisions in those decisions. And in order to hold the government and the public services to account, because this, this law applies to the public services, which are in the responsibility of the Welsh government, are the future generations commissioner, the auditor general, and the courts. And I put the links up on this slide um, and I hope that uh, we could perhaps share these slides afterwards so that people could um, have a look and, and follow those links if they choose to do so. And what is really interesting, and uh, Rennie, you said at the outset, we're the only country in the world to have made this law. What is also interesting, and I was somewhat shocked to find, 
that we are the only country in the world to have made a law that enables the Sustainable Development Goals to be delivered. So despite over 190 UN member states signing up to the SDGs, not one has a legal mechanism to deliver them. And this may be just about small countries and feeling that, that actually tying all this together at a small country basis makes it a lot easier. But there's a direct link therefore between the goals in Wales and how that relates to the sustainable development goals. And therefore there's quite a lot of work going on in Wales at the moment between youth climate ambassadors and what's called the global goalkeepers, young people in schools who are taking goals and actually looking about how they can be applied in their school setting and in their curriculum. <clears throat> and you may not realise that in fact there are moves afoot in England for similar legislation. Lord John Bird, he of big issue fame, has already um, taken a private members bill through the House of Lords and that is now going to the Commons. And at the end of January, it will receive its second reading. So Lord John Bird has taken it through the Lords and Caroline Lucas MP will lead it through the Commons. There's an all party parliamentary group um, actually looking at supporting this bill at the moment. And I was privileged to be asked to go and speak to them uh, because of telling the story of Wales in my book, Future Gen. And the campaign is called Today for Tomorrow. So if you actually look up Today for Tomorrow, you can see what the proposal for a well-being of future generations bill looks like for England. In many ways based on the Welsh bill, but the point about the Welsh bill is it's a bill for Wales. It was an act for Wales. And therefore those people who defined what was in the law were the Welsh politicians with advice from civil society and others. So in England, if there is going to be a bill that could ever turn into law, it will undoubtedly be different because it's a different country, a much bigger country, and therefore it would be different kinds of arrangements. But what was very interesting in talking to the all party parliamentary group uh, about the book was they found that the 140 contributors that I have in the book, who've actually identified um, some of the issues that would need to be dealt with at any level, have been really helpful to them in looking at how to make decisions. And also the story about decision making, because at the end of the day, those uh, ways of working that I outlined are actually OECD best practice. So this is not just a sustainability agenda, this is about how we take good practice in terms of good decision making and turn it into law. And for me, that was actually the, uh, very much the premise on which I started my journey as the person who, who was able to propose the legislation. And I think that we're now at a time when we do need a really big vision post-COVID. And there's been huge numbers of people who have uh, generated content, whether it's building back better, building better, green recovery. You'll have seen a lot of this and undoubtedly people in your university, not least because you've got quite a lot of climate activists looking at your site, have been involved in those, in those sorts of debate. And I'm very much reminded of that post-war framework where after so many people had given their lives and Britain was recovering. And what were the first pieces of legislation that came out of that time? Of course, what we saw uh, from 1944 uh, uh, onwards, we saw an Education Act, we saw a Health Act, we saw council housing built in ways that had never been done before. And in fact, it was very much about satisfying the physiological and safety needs that we know from Maslow's hierarchy of need, water, food, shelter, employment, health, the kind of things that are absolutely necessary if you want to rebuild society. And there probably will need to be some of that in the context of post-COVID, because I'm sure you, like me, have been saddened by the number of people on food banks in our um, uh, we've been seeing on our TV screens. The number of people who have suffered dreadfully in this pandemic and of course we're told that we may well have to be wearing masks and be very careful for another year until we know the efficacy of the vaccines. But that Green New Deal, that green recovery as 
um, a mantra is one that is actually garnering a lot of support. And some of you will have seen that today the UK Committee on Climate Change, an independent committee, but chaired by Lord Deben, uh, Right Honourable John Gummer, has just produced its new report, the sixth carbon budget covering the period to the mid 2030s. And it sees this as the UK's path to net zero. And what's incredible when you look at the front of that report is that the people who have made this happen are not the politicians, it's the academics from our universities. They're the ones who are giving the evidence-based advice to governments across the world, to businesses and others in terms of how to take action. There is a requirement, uh, just to note, for, of the UK government to legislate on the next carbon budget by June 2021. And of course, since that's just before, we're going to have the COP in Glasgow, the big climate change conference of parties in Glasgow. I think I can fairly confidently anticipate that the government is likely to pass this budget proposals. But I wonder whether people have any idea what this actually means. This sixth carbon budget is proposing a 78% reduction in UK emissions by 2035 from 1990 levels. Now we know 1990 was a long time ago and we know that between 1990 and 2035 we're just over halfway. So one could make an assumption um, that we perhaps are halfway to that, but we're not. That equals a 63% reduction from where we are now, because we've only done 15% so far. And so the work that you've done in your university in reducing your emissions is really important. But Britain is going to have to reduce emissions by 63% from its 2019 levels. And the committee is proposing that there should be a separate pledge to reduce emissions by 68% by 2030. Now Wales has already committed to have its public sector um, net zero by 2030 and this is about uh, having a process and a sequence that starts now. And the kind of things that this means, and um, Rennie you, you in fact outlined some of them at the outset, the kind of things this means is it will increase walking, cycling, but it'll also be about less carbon intensive diets. It will be about having to live more adaptively. It will be about removing fossil fuels. They recommend that oil should have gone by 2028. Gas should have gone by 2033. All cars will be electric or hydrogen. HGVs will be gone by 2040. Waste recycling will need to be up to 70% by 2030. Now Wales is already there, but I started that recycling process in Wales back in 2009. And so we're talking about a very rapid transition in England where the recycling is very poor. A ban on biodegradable waste going to landfill by 2025. Public finances will have to ensure that they only purchase zero carbon by 2030. There should be an introduction of carbon taxes. Increased efficiency such as electronics, I'm sure we'd all like to see that, to see that things actually last again, um, but also that whole notion about how you reduce demand. In transport, that will be reduced flights until there are alternative fuels. That will be encouragement to reduce travel demand. In land use, that will be about 440,000 hectares of new woodland, low carbon farming, 260,000 hectares shifted to bioenergy, the restoration of peat bogs. If I quote the report, the implication of this path is clear. The utmost focus is required from the government over the next 10 years. If policy is not scaled up across every sector, if business is not encouraged to invest, if the people of the UK are not engaged in the challenge, the UK will not be able to deliver net zero by 2050. The 2020s must be 
the decisive decade of progress and action. Now, what does this mean for us as citizens, all those of us on this call today? We can already make low carbon choices about how we travel, about how we heat our homes, about what we buy and what we eat, if we're privileged to do so. But the committee also points out this has to be fair. So government is going to need to step in for those who cannot do these things for themselves. And what's been really interesting, and I don't know whether you followed this, but there have been UK climate assemblies that have shown that if people understand what is needed and why, and if they have options, and if they can be involved in the decision-making processes, they support the transition to net zero because they know that is the only secure way of supporting the lives of young people on this call now and future generations following you. So I think there's a big question to us all. To what extent are we prepared to be part of the solution, not the problem? Just a small anecdote, I remember many years ago when I was the climate change, energy, environment, sustainability, planning, <laughs> just about everything else minister. I went to visit um, a company on the outskirts of Wrexham that made solar panels and the company was in trouble and uh, I was invited to come and you know I think they were looking for a sort of feel-good factor out of my visit and the question I asked the assembled crowd and there were probably a couple of hundred people sitting in the room was how many of you use the solar panels that you make here and about three hands went up and then we wonder why a company that actually was ahead of the game was not able to sustain that performance in Wales. I think what that climate change report is saying to us today is that we've talked long enough. We know the actions we need to take, but we've got to actually take them and not talk about taking them which is why I'm very pleased to hear that your next sustainability strategy is going to be absolutely linked to the corporate uh, plan. Universities have an incredibly important role. They have an incredibly important role in the context of educating the next generation. They have an incredibly important role in providing the academics to advise government and policymakers and people about strategies, about behaviour change, about what can be done, about the art of the possible. Only a few weeks ago, some of you will have picked up that there was a mock cop devised and put together by young people uh, to basically challenge the decision makers on the fact that they could have done it all by Zoom. But in fact, that mock cop was really good at uh, highlighting 18 key elements, but they started with the idea that in the curriculum, at all ages, there has to be up-to-date education about the climate crisis and there has to be education about our connection with nature for all children. Now these are still peripheral issues in many environments, well probably in most environments. And I was reminded, Rennie, when you talked to me earlier about Peter Drucker's statement, what gets measured gets managed even when it's pointless to measure and manage it, and even if it harms the purpose of the organisation to do so. We need to be measured in the context of how we respond to this climate challenge. We need to be measured individually. We need to be measured as communities. We definitely need to be measured as universities with that dual function of providing the evidence base and educating the next leaders of the generation. And so I look forward to seeing this university maintain its leadership role, to see this university maintaining that leadership by demonstrating what can be done in a university that maintains its commitment in the context of sustainability and is prepared to actively engage with its student body and those who provide that evidence to create a real future for future generations born and unborn. I'm acutely aware that as somebody who's just taken my mother home, who's been with me for my last two and a half months during Covid, she's 90, 
and three days ago I had my second grandchild. Well, I didn't have my second grandchild, but I, <laughs> I am now <laughs> the proud grandparent of a second grandchild. And between them, effectively, is probably at least 200 years in terms of their um, experience of life. But the life of my grandchild will be affected positively or negatively by what we do in this decade. That is our challenge. Thank you. Jane, thank you ever so much. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Stephen Marston. I'm Vice Chancellor of the University of Gloucestershire. Uh, and my first and very welcome uh, role this evening is to thank Jane enormously uh, for such an inspirational and insightful lecture. I thought that was just great. Not easy listening always, but then I don't think you meant it to be. Uh, you know, you were confronting us as a university, as individuals, as a society with some immense challenges. Equally, I think what you were doing is saying it is possible to provide leadership here, to get people to take it seriously, to start some serious planning on, so what do we need to do in changing our actions, our lives, our behaviours? It can be done. And I thought it was just a wonderful uh, case study. Thank you for it in terms of what you were able to do in, in Wales in leading the agenda. So thank you. Um, what we're now going to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is go into a discussion uh, session. Uh, we have a panel um, that we've put together, Jane herself, uh, the Chancellor of the University, Rennie Fritchie. We have the President of our Students' Union, Luke Brown. And I think uh, on my screen it's shown as a rather dark black uh, rectangle UOG corporate. Is, is that Alex Ryan, our Director of Sustainability? No, she's, she's there separately. Alex, are you there? There, Stephen. Oh, excellent. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I think we have about 150 people on the call. Um, what we will now do for the next um, somewhere between <clears throat> 20, 25 minutes uh, is a discussion uh, with our panel. We have some themes that we wanted to pick up in the discussion. Uh, and if you would, Please do also put comments or questions for Jane or any member of the panel uh, into the question and answer uh, box. Uh, you should be able to find that uh, at the bottom of your screen, the, the, the icon called Q&A. If you would like to put any questions, make any comments, then uh, we will keep an eye on uh, those and, and raise them as part of the discussion. So I hope that makes sense for everybody. And what we will do is then kick off with a couple of uh, areas for debate um, that were identified. And the first of them, I'm going to start with uh, Luke, if I may, uh, because as uh, Jane said, this is very much about uh, future generations and what we owe to them. Luke's theme was around um, what should universities be doing to be good ancestors for future generations? And how can we empower student leaders um, to lead this agenda? So mm. let's kick off there. Luke, what is your own view on this? Do you want to start us yeah, off? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Jane, for that really powerful talk. It's, it's fantastic listening to you. And and kind of hearing that case study about Wales, it's really interesting. Um, obviously, uh, I'll hold my hands up, of course, I put the, the topic about empowering students first. As president of the Students' Union, uh, I have the privilege of working with students every single day who are keen and active leaders who contribute towards our society and our community in ways that I never even knew, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't know how how incredible the, the, the kind of student communities could be at universities and, and around the area. And um, one of my keen passions this year has been to, um, to empower those student leaders. And Jane, you made a really interesting point around kind of the, the culture of 
Wales in your example and the culture of our university and, and picking out the points where we can really have a, an ability to empower our students and not just giving them the resources and the knowledge and the experience, but also giving them the, the ability to transfer that education onto other people. And this is some of the big work that I'm doing this year is to not just educate students and, and teach them, but also teach them how to teach others. And I think with something like this, it's really important that we are doing that so that it's not just a generation to generation, it spreads everywhere. And, and it would be really interesting to hear everyone's thoughts on the panel around, you know, what as an as a institution, as a university, what should we be doing? What are we doing well? What do we need to do more of in order to really empower our students to, to, do, to keep on doing the amazing thing they've been doing and to, to carry on in the right direction? Thanks, Luke. Shane, I don't know if you'd like to, to come in on that and but drawing on your own experience at Trinity St David's as well as your wider experience as, as, a, as a minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm terribly heartened by um, the passion that Luke is displaying in the context of um, being wanting to encourage other young people to be leaders in this field. Um, it, what's really interesting is that a lot of people come to university, a lot of students come to university without an understanding of these issues at all because they haven't had them through the curriculum. They'll know the words, but they don't necessarily understand the impact in their, their daily lives. And we, we ran, um, you, you probably have something similar, but we ran an internship scheme, um, a paid internship scheme um, through Trinity St David for the period of time I, I, I there. And although I can't claim credit uh, for, the, for, for this, but Trinity St. David uh, has now produced the last three student presidents in Wales. All of, them, all of them have been my interns. And I think that what was interesting about that is they all developed a passion for the changes that need to happen, which they then, as, as Luke talked about, they then educated others um, about and that therefore that kind of approach led to an enormous cascading of information and also um, a collect collectivity I think and congeniality because this isn't something any of us want to face alone that if we can face it collectively it can be fun so you know if you're out there collectively planting woodlands if you're out there um, collectively uh, doing something whether it's uh, litter picking or any of those sort of smaller elements it starts teaching you around the environment and making you love nature more if you're out collectively cycling then it also is very good for your physical and and, and mental health but also you find out what to do so I remember it was actually on one of those um, conversations 20 years ago that I realised that one of the things I could do overnight was change my energy provider and therefore literally I could reduce my carbon emissions hugely just by going well well I'm, I, I go with good energy so somebody very local to you as it turns out but that whole notion of there are some things where you can change your your contribution to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem really quickly and I think Luke if you and your colleagues can really identify how you can maximize that and I'm sure you're doing that already that will be tremendously useful for staff in the university as well as other students. Brilliant thank you and could I bring in Alex Ryan at that point. Uh, Alex Jane has thrown down the gauntlet to us as a university uh, and you know what what could we be doing more in terms of particularly working with students empowering students thank you and jane thank you because you've thrown down some brilliant gauntlets and said some truly inspiring things in this talk this evening thank you it's fantastic to have you back um one of the things that you said that really struck me was when you were talking about the act and the ways of working and you said but actually this was just good practice anyway. These are just the right ways of working anyway. And I think that one of the things that universities and including ours need to do right now is to return to the fundamental concepts of what we ought to be as a university, which is to stand on the platforms of the science 
that we are holding as a collective sector and to be incredibly bold and forward-looking now about how quickly we can deploy that through education and through partnership. And I say that very much to all of us in my sector with the spirit of we cannot afford to rest on our laurels and be comfortable in our habitual ways of being universities in ivory towers. We are there in society to support society and be beacons for society, not just by inventing new knowledge, but by applying it. And I think one of the reasons that sustainability and sustainability education has taken such a hold at our university is because this university was always a small and dynamic and hungry organization that loved applied learning. And one of the ways that we have to constantly be more ambitious in our academic environment is not just to be expert professors of this and that and produce that knowledge and transmit it, but we need to be inculcating in our people a soft skill set which contains an ability to understand change and system change and how to make it happen. And we've got to do that quickly. Jane said to us tonight, we've got this decade now. And Rennie has said to us, but there is hope because we've just been learning how to hurry up about change this year. We've all learned a considerable amount about how rapidly we can adapt. And that's really hopeful. But the way that we need to accelerate this is to not just have the knowledge, but apply it and actually to collaborate not just with our partners, you know, for instance, in our region where we're surrounded by sustainability hungry and green companies, but also with our students because they have an endless passion and an appetite to get on with this because it's so existential to them. And we've begun on that road, but we need to go faster. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm noting that we have our uh, first few questions uh, please, uh, anybody involved this evening, do put in your comments and your questions, but let's just pick up some of those. The, the first one, has this awful global pande pandemic had an accidentally good effect through its reduction in transport pollution? Um, again, Jane, I don't know if you'd like to pick that up. How does this look in terms of the work you've been doing in in Wales? Do you think we can look forward to a significant reduction in transport pollution? I think I think I think there's two things um, here Stephen. I think the first one is that we know that there's been dramatic emissions reduction in the context of um, the uh, of aeroplanes um, because there's so few of them have been flying compared to normal. And we know also that there has been similar reductions in public transport across the UK. But actually, we need public transport <laughs> because it is the vehicle by, or the means by which a lot of people move around. And of course, it has been moving, but it's been moving emptier. And therefore, actually, emissions per capita have gone up quite dramatically in, 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 in that context. But I think that just as Alex was saying that because we've learned to adapt to things very quickly, perhaps what we will be able to do is adapt to much more demand-led um, opportunities to access transport. Um, so that uh, in my area, living in the, in, in, the, in the north of Pembrokeshire, I have watched empty buses coming past me a few times a day. And that's not good use of anybody's um, money or time. But actually, if we'd had a, a demand-led system, we could probably have had far fewer emissions and far more satisfied customers, not least in terms of getting the uh, to transport at the right times. So I think that if the COVID experience, which has had to make us change in so many ways so quickly, and where we've seen so much adaptability and innovation, enables us to treat all these aspects in the same way. I know that's what the Committee of Climate Change are relying on, because they say as much in the report. They think that the innovation that's already been demonstrated means that actually we'll find solutions to all of these things. But we must always make sure it's just, Stephen. So it has to ensure that those people who don't have the means are not cut out of a decent life, because those 
resources are taken away. It seems to me it's also a really good instance, and, and thank you for the question, that we are at a moment in time where we will have to make some choices. Yeah. If there are vaccines, if we do get lockdown sorted out, if we do then have an opportunity to um, pick up what, what normal life used to be, do we go back to everything as it was, or do we take that as, that as our moment to try to go forward to something better? And as individuals and as a country, we will have a choice, and it's coming up sort of now, really. What do we choose to do? Do we choose to make those changes? And this one is very, very real for us at, at the University of Gloucestershire. Our single biggest challenge now in our sustainability strategy that Alex and colleagues are grappling with is, what on earth do we do really about our scope three emissions? Because we can control scope one and scope two, but the transport that we all choose to use is the single biggest source now of our carbon emissions. And we have some choices to make and they may well be quite painful choices. But really good question, thank, thank you. Um, shall we go on? Then there's a... Stephen, could I come in? Of course, sorry. Ren. Sorry, I've been waving and um, just a couple of things. One is, I think uh, it would be quite good uh, to do some silver linings research in relation to COVID. Uh, so quite separately, if we take good mental health and mental ill health, the stigma attached to that has been attached for hundreds of years. And those of us who worked in mental health have done all that we can to try to promote talking about it and dealing with it. What COVID has done has put it on the front of everybody's thinking. Everybody's talking about well-being and good mental health. And nobody's going around saying uh, we shouldn't be talking about it because it's mental health. So I think it would be interesting for some research to be done about silver linings. I'd like to come back to Luke's point about what might we do. And I think one of the things that um, is never successful is if one group of people confront another group of people about why they're wrong. So if we could have some challenges about what we could do together, rather than whose fault is this, and you should do something. So I think, Luke, we could do some interesting thinking together in the university with students about what we could do together to make a difference. And the last thing I'd like to say is, Stephen, you and I uh, last year were asked to go and speak to a number of um, head teachers of very well-known schools in the country about sustainability. It was at a time when Greta Thunberg was uh, encouraging young people to march. And uh, some of the teachers were saying, well, of course, they had forbidden their students to go out on a particular day with placards because the lens they were looking at was safeguarding the children that they were looking after and not letting them wander off premises and also discipline. The next time I talked to one of the head teachers, who's a really, I think, insightful and creative head teacher. She said, well, of course, the next day they were marching, we were with them. We went with them. The school backed them. We, and so it's the lens we look through these different things to say, um, if, if you're going to do something, can we look at it together and make something happen? And that changed the nature of the relationship between students and the school. But it also meant that everyone was out on the street uh, in Cheltenham on that day, including my granddaughters, all marching with placards. Thank you. Thank you, Rennie. And I might just link that to a theme I know you were, were interested to explore, uh, which is um, what is university now for? in helping to challenge and educate young people. And there's a, a, a comment from Paul there, um, which I think is in similar territory. Uh, last week, England's chief inspector of schools rejected the idea that climate change should be covered more seriously in the curriculum, 
we may have to make, wait many years before young people are taught the truth. Where do you feel teacher educators might best focus their efforts in the meantime? And um, perhaps we could, uh, yeah. Rennie, do you want to, to pick that if one I, up? If I, I'll pick it up and start it off and then, because it's a particular bugbear of mine, and I'd start with the regulators, those who look at and measure how successful universities are, have traditionally done it on research, who's going to get the money and who the government is going to back. And now the latest measure seems to me to be only how many of our uh, students are going to be in well-paid jobs within a few months after they leave the university. And the reason I was talking to Jane about Peter Drucker was about measuring the wrong things. Drucker said, if you measure it, you manage it. And therefore, whether it's the right thing to measure or manage, uh, we'll measure it anyway, even if it goes against the purpose of the organization. Now, for me, this university and all universities have a much bigger job to do to enable young people to learn about a great many things, to grow, to develop, to challenge, to question, to develop character, to really make a huge difference, not just to be able to pass the exam that equips them to get a job to earn this amount of money. And therefore, if the only thing we're going to be measured on is that at a time with COVID when there are no jobs, we're measuring the wrong thing. So we need to challenge not just universities, but we need to challenge those regulators and government and those in opposition to make sure that we understand what a university is for and we can develop that thinking together with students. What do they expect it to be for? And of course they must earn a living. Of course they want to have a good and successful future, but it's so much more than that. So I feel uh, fairly passionate about this one, that we need to challenge together people who want to diminish us and the role that we play uh, in helping develop students by diminishing students to just be a worker somewhere. Sorry, I'm, I'm ranting, but it's, I'm <laughs> passionate about this. Indeed. Um, Shane, I, I don't know if, if you'd like to sort of comment on that one as well. I mean, the, the, the role of teacher educators, what, what is it that we should now be focusing on? I think the critical role of teacher educators um, is to be a teacher educator, <laughs> which means that they have an obligation to ensure that the young people in their care have as great an understanding as they have, as they can of the world around them. And I think what's particularly interesting of, for universities that are also um, institutes of teacher education, that they have an absolute obligation to do this. The curriculum is only part of the story of the school experience. And there are so many other aspects of the school experience that can be um, engaged with in, in the context of these debates. And I think it's also important that there is a movement at the moment across the UK called Teach the Future. And Teach the Future is young people who are still in school, who are looking across their peer group in terms of the creation of curriculum materials that they can then present to their schools in terms of teaching them. And I think that in the context of that point I was making previously about the NUS now having a decade of study of students saying they, they expect their universities to teach them about sustainability because their schools don't. We cannot go into this decade that the UK Committee on Climate Change says is the most significant decade in our lifetimes in terms of making the changes to secure the uh, future generations without future generations understanding those issues around climate change. So it may not enter the school curriculum in traditional ways, but that doesn't stop schools as educators uh, making sure that it's there anyway. And if I may, Rennie mentioned a discussion we had with some local head teachers uh, last year. And one of the points that stayed with me was that we need to educate in, so what can each of us do, our own individual responsibilities and, and agency and power to act, but 
what also came out was a, a real uh, focus from the, 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 the head teachers and colleagues there. Actually, it is really important to help our students understand system change, yeah. as well as your own individual actions. How, does, how do big systems get influenced and reshaped? How do you bring about change in a system that is quite literally as big as the globe? So can we educate in system change as well as our own individual roles and the techniques and tools and ways in which you as young people can influence whole systems? And I thought that was just a, you know, an, an important thought to take into our, our role as, as educators. Stephen, could I quickly... Oh, go on, Jane. After you, after you. Are you sure? Yes. I was going to say, may I, um, may, may I just say that... Um, I think that you've absolutely hit the nail on the head in that one. Um, and of course, system change is not just about evidence. And that's really what I was going to say is that the, my book is predicated on, on, for me, one of the greatest systems thinking, Professor Donella Meadows. Um, and she was particularly focused on sustainability and she wrote a book called Limits to Growth. Um, and in her book, Limits to Growth, she assumed that when the science was telling us how much more we were using up of the Earth's resources than we had available, that governments would take action. <laughs> and then she realised she was wrong. And when she went to Limits to Growth, the 30 year update in the early 2000s, which is when I first um, uh, you know, engaged with her work, she said that actually it wasn't the elements about the evidence that was going to change people's minds. It was actually about other, softer, less tangible elements. And she said it had to be about having a vision, a strategy, learning, living and loving. And that's Rennie's point. And it's, it's that notion that we have to, it's not about allocating blame, but if we are of doing whatever we do in the interest of the whole of society uh, in a non-judgmental way it's doing our very best all the time to bring people up to the level of understanding and that becomes a mission I'm afraid so if you if you <laughs> if you like what I'm saying I'm condemning you to a mission for the rest of your life <laughs> over to you Luke <laughs> thank you yeah I, I, that's such a Fascinating point, Jane. And I think something that you mentioned in the, uh, in the in the PowerPoint earlier is that whenever change has to happen, the people who the change will happen for should be involved in that decision making of the change happening. And I think that is is something that uh, we do really well at our university. I, I think that the students are right there involved with Alex and with the sustainability team. And you know, we've got some live smart interns, and we've got people who are really kind of creating this change and they're feeding back in and implementing in and we've got members of the student union in lots of different spaces and processes and policies and that it's such an important thing to allow the people that the change will affect in to make that change or to help contribute towards that change of course and and you know with with mock cop and, and everything that happened these young people from all over the world came together to go actually you know what we can do it why haven't they done it? We're going to do it better. And that's such a fascinating and inspiring thing that students and young people can come and that they can do all of, all of these things that, you know, quite frankly, some older, older, the older generation didn't want to do, didn't do, wouldn't, wouldn't do, who knows. Um, but it's such a, an important thing. And, and to go back to Renny's point very quickly about the, the way in which success is measured at university it is so much more the than the degree. It will always be so much more than the degree. It is my experience of university and so many students. It is a truly transformational place. Uh, I know Alex wants to come in very quickly. I just wanted to reinforce, thanks yeah. for what you were saying and what excited me so much in what Rennie was saying about measuring the wrong things and the system change and doing it together because you know that something's wrong when your regulator is measuring graduate employment, like you said, at a time like this, 
and when those studies that are coming out from the NUS are saying that graduates are willing to take a pay cut to join an ethical and responsible organization. So this tells you, if we listen to our students, they will tell us about the world they want created. And these are not uncarved blocks. These students have ideas and solution and will and energy to take this stuff forward. So we need to work with that as well as using whatever bits of extra wisdom that we might still have left over in our rucksacks from our journeys to actually help them to develop and stretch forward on some of the things that we do have to share, like that wisdom from the hard years on the road of what system change is actually like, how irrational it can be, how non-linear it can be, how it is emergent. Jane talked about appetite and raising appetite. We need to raise an appetite for this new kind of education because none of us have quite known what it looked like until just about now when we've started doing it and we've got some things to point to and go that is what it looks like and we've got graduates like the ones you you were talking about Luke I know some of the wonderful graduates we've got here who are going on to do incredible things already half of my name graduated some of these students they are showing us what it looks like now and it's live and we need to take that energy forward and work with all those brilliant partners around us who've got common cause in this and never mind what the regulators are going to say about it because we will attract students and be vital and vibrant as an organization through catching that energy. Alex thank you. Um, very conscious of the time. Uh, may we just take one more question because I, I do want to give our our, our audience opportunities as well. So just one final question. Uh, Richard Jardine, um, in Victorian times, more enlightened employers understood the importance of having good housing for their staff, built housing near the workplace. UOG spends much time planning student housing and transport around the university. Obviously, we're in a different place now. But do you think major employers such as UOG should feed into the house planning of the councils to try to get new housing closer to the workplace to reduce traveling and reduce the impact on greenbelt land for those who will desire it in future so a very different theme um, jane i think you said that one of the many many hats you had involved planning so do you have a view on on that one you know what what might we be trying to do as part of this agenda in relation to ho housing and housing planning um yes i think i think the the, the difficulty is that um, uh, all the four countries have separate planning systems, Stephen. And um, I think that the way the Welsh planning system, which has moved to incorporate the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, um, uh, is a, in an entirely different direction uh, to the English system. I mean, certainly what we have been trying to do through planning is to uh, support low carbon housing, to look at the locations uh, in terms of planning. Um, uh, local authorities have a have a very Im important role, and they create their own local plans that have to go through the um, through the government. But there's not the wholesale house building nor the pressures that there are in England. Um, and I know that there are some particular issues on pressures on the sort of fringes of uh, towns and cities. Um, and I think that the I think the only thing I'd put into it in the English context is what I was saying about land use um, is going to be a really important trade-off for the UK government in terms of looking at just where it's going to get its expanded woodlands or carbon capture elements um, in the context of where also it wants new housing and what kind of housing that is going to be. Um, so I think there's always legitimate questions to raise in terms of planning to ensuring how the housing is fit for purpose for uh, future generations. A lot of it still isn't. Great. Thank you, Jane. It's already a quarter past seven. Um, so I think that we should probably draw this to a close now. So may I, on behalf of uh, everybody who's been uh, attending this evening, uh, thank Jane very much indeed. These are quite difficult times because of the pandemic. 
they're quite difficult times because we can all see the threats from climate change. But I hope you feel, as I do, that actually what Jane and our panel have brought home to us is that nonetheless, we do not need to be victims of this situation. There is much that we can do individually, as the university, as organizations, as a society. This is still absolutely within our power to manage, to turn to good effect, to put the focus on well-being and sustainability, not just on short-term uh, material issues. So I think I will take away, despite everything, a message of hope from what uh, Jane said to us this evening. Um, one of the downsides of doing these things on Zoom is that it's not possible to have a round of applause, at least not that anyone else can hear. But uh, Jane, thank you. That was hugely informative. It was hugely inspirational. Thank you to the panel, to Luke, to Rennie, to Alex. Uh, thank you to uh, Lystra and John who have been doing all of the technical organising behind the scenes. Thank you to our audience for taking part this evening. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it. I hope you've gained something from it. And particularly to Jane, thank you so much for your lecture and for being with us this evening.